Greetings, comrades! It is no secret that after the collapse of the USSR, the much desired and wonderful democracy finally triumphed in the country. But how long did it last? Until 2020, when Vladimir Putin rewrote the constitution for his eternal rule. Until 2012, when Medvedev handed him the presidency without a fight. Until 2007, when United Russia was able to pass any laws it wanted without even looking at other parties in the parliament. Uh, no. Democracy in Free Russia actually lived for about 20 months. Yes, not even two years. And then the disagreements between the president and the country's parliament got to the point where the president decided to use the ultimate political weapon against the parliament. Tanks, with which he mercilessly shelled the government building. And won. In fact, this pretentious introduction doesn't quite reflect the reality of life. Well, can we say with certainty that Russia was a democratic country from 1991 to 1993 if no elections were held in the country during that time? Or maybe it was a democratic country when its leaders ignored the will of the people during the referendum on the preservation of the USSR and signed the documents in the Belovezhskaya Pusha anyway? Could a body assembled in another country even be called a parliament of Russia? And did Russia immediately become as undemocratic and authoritarian as possible in November 1993? Of course not. The world is not so black and white, and such extreme statements are only good for getting you to click on a video titled On such a such a day, democracy died in Russia. It is much more complicated than that. Nevertheless, October 1993 is certainly the first in a series of major turning points that brought modern Russia to the form in which it exists today. Let's talk about how the events of that fall took place. Who was on both sides of the barricades in the center of Moscow? And, of course, the main question. How could you bring your country to such a state in two years that your only option to influence your own parliament and your own vice president was six TATUD tanks? Thirty years have passed since the events of October 1993, and now we can look back impartially and ask one simple question. How was this even remotely possible? But in fact, there is still no consensus on this question. Both sides agree that those events can and should be characterized as an attempted mutiny. But which side was the mutineer in the first place? If you ask the president's supporters, everything happened because the damned communists who occupied the House of Soviets persistently dragged the country backwards, opposed all important democratic reforms, and generally dreamed of reviving the USSR and becoming the CPSU 2.0. The communists themselves claimed that this was because Yeltsin and his cronies were more interested in personal enrichment than in the development of Russia, and their insane economic reforms had made the population ten times poorer within a year. Well, you know, I always like to deal with these issues by looking from both perspectives. And usually I would say, Actually, all those accusations were false and were just a pretext, and now I'm going to tell you what really happened. But not this time. Because this time both sides were right, in a way. Communists from the parliament really wanted to return everything to the way it was. We were not averse to reattaching the pieces of the USA that had fallen off and sabotaged many initiatives of the president and the government. Meanwhile, the shock therapy and reforms of Yeltsin and Gaidar of 1992 really cannot be described as anything other than insane or even malicious. And the selfish motivation was probably present in their actions. But let's understand how the two sides came to this heated confrontation between the executive and legislative branches of government, which resulted in the deaths of more than 100 people in the center of Moscow. In fact, the reason for the almost unleashed civil war of 1993 is very trivial. The reason is that the side of Yeltsin and his associates successfully dismantled the Soviet Union, but did not have time to get rid of all its inheritance. And two years after the collapse of the USSR, this inheritance decided to clash with the president in the last decisive battle. On the one side was President Boris Yeltsin and his supporters, the executive power. 
On the other hand, the Supreme Soviet of the Russian Federation, under the leadership of Vice President Alexander Rutskoy and Speaker of the Supreme Soviet Ruslan Hasbulatov. The Supreme Soviet of the Russian Federation is a rather interesting body. And it's interesting because Russia inherited it from the USSR, and it lived for two years without any changes. It was not some abstract body without special powers, but a full-fledged parliament. The newly created Russia was not a super-presidential republic at that time, so in fact the Supreme Soviet had a great deal of power and could significantly influence or even overrule the president's decisions. In fact, this is what they did for two years between 1991 and 1993, even refusing to change the wording of Brezhnev's constitution. Yes, the young Russia had a constitution adopted in 1978 under the USSR in force for two years, with all the ensuing consequences. That was a paradox. It would seem that in 1991 there was a real change of power, the face and lead of which was Boris Yeltsin. The country in which this change took place, the USSR, or its part the RSFSR, ceased to exist. It was replaced by the Russian Federation, and the same Boris Yeltsin became its leader. But at the same time, for some reason for two years at least formally, the majority of power in this new country was held by a body that was created under the previous system and in the previous country in 1990. And this body for the most part did not support the newly minted president at all. And also the constitution which was left over from that very different country. All in all, a truly explosive situation. But does that mean that the open conflict could not be avoided? Of course not. But the stakes were too high. Power implies the possession of financial and political resources, and the redistribution of these resources between a president with special powers, who is also a very popular leader, and a strong parliament was almost inevitable. So, what happened in the Russian Federation between 1991 and 1993? Let's look at the same 1978 constitution, still the supreme law, albeit borrowed from a corpse. So, according to this constitution, in Russia there was the post of the president of the country, and it was added to that old constitution only in 1991, specifically for Boris Yeltsin. There was also the Congress of People's Deputies, which was elected for the first time on the basis of universal suffrage in 1990, for a term of five years. It had unprecedentedly broad authority, even in comparison with Western parliaments. It was proclaimed the supreme authority of any kind, to which the government, the courts and everyone in general were accountable. As long as the RSFSR was part of the USSR, no one really cared about this, because the Communist Party was still on top. And no matter what powers the parliament of one of the republics had on paper, they had no real authority anyway. But the party disappeared along with the USSR, but the constitution and deputies remained. It's funny, but many experts still believe that those very elections on March 4th, 1990, that is, under the USSR, are still the most transparent, democratic and fair in the entire history of Russia. But ok, let's say that there was a situation in the country that due to constant amendments to the constitution, a kind of dual power was established. But in any case, it would have been impossible to use the constitution of the dead state forever. In any case, it would have been necessary to write a new one. They could have reached an agreement while writing it, right? As it turned out, no. The fact is that it was the Congress of People's Deputies and the Supreme Soviet elected by this Congress that had the exclusive right to change the constitution. It was very easy for the Congress deputies to amend the constitution, so this document turned out to be extremely unstable. In 1990, 53 amendments were adopted, in 1991, 29, and in 1992, as many as 258. In 1993, the Congress got brazen and tried to fully transfer the executive power to itself, for which they were eventually shelled with tanks. What was the president, Boris Yeltsin, doing at that time? He also proposed his own draft versions of the constitution, but they never came to an agreement with the parliament. Perhaps in a year or two, closer to the end of the deputy's term, they would have been able to reach a peaceful agreement. But then the brilliant reforms of Boris Yeltsin and his government, which tried to liberalize and reform the economy, came into play. 
it is worth making a separate video about them. But for now it is sufficient to say that the reforms of the first years of Yeltsin's rule turned out to be such a failure that they led to a sharp deterioration in the living standards of citizens, and yesterday's hero of the people became the object of harsh criticism. As a result, the Supreme Soviet saw its chance. The strength of Yeltsin's position as a president was solely due to the fact that he had a certain amount of popular support. After all, it was largely for him that people took to the streets in 1991 to defend new Russia from the GKCP. And this popular love for Yeltsin began to sharply decrease in 1992-1993, proportionally to how the amount of food in people's fridge decreased. By the spring-summer of 1993, the discontent of the people had reached a maximum, and the Supreme Soviet decided to adopt the tactic of not a step back, and stopped making any compromise through the president. The assumption was that if the Supreme Soviet managed to remove Yeltsin from the presidency, and technically they had that power, no one would take to the streets for him this time, and then it would be possible to slightly reshape the balance of power in the new Russia. The Congress of Deputies will play the same role as under the USSR, the position of the President will become honorable but extremely limited in powers, and the main authority in the country should be someone who is higher than the Congress of Deputies. In the USSR it was the CPSU, and here this elite will be the Supreme Soviet. Makes sense? Makes sense. Good plan? Good plan. Where did they miscalculate? All this political tug of war resulted in an open conflict between the president and the parliament, which culminated on October 3rd and 4th, 1993, and ended in street clashes. Well, the starting point is considered to be September 21st, 1993, when President Boris Yeltsin signed Decree No. 1400 on phased constitutional reform. It totally eliminated the legislative power both the Congress of People Deputies and the Supreme Soviet formed by the Congress. At the same time, as I have already said, Yeltsin had no authority to do so. At an emergency session of the Constitutional Court of the Russian Federation, it was ruled that the presidential decree violated the Constitution of the Russian Federation, and was the basis for the removal of Boris Yeltsin from the post of president. Although, frankly speaking, the Constitutional Court did not even read the full text of this document, but made its decision based on Yeltsin's speech on TV, so not everything was in accordance with the law here either. Relying on the court decision, the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet announced the termination of the President's power and ruled that the reform decree was not enforceable. At the same time, the acting Vice President, Alexander Rudskoy, was assigned the duties of the President. On September 24th, the 10th Congress of People's Deputies was urgently convened, which supported this decision and assessed the President's action as a coup d'etat. But Boris Yeltsin, of course, was not going anywhere. He still enjoyed considerable support from the people, the government and, most importantly, the military. Actually, it was the position of the security forces that decided the final outcome of the confrontation. After all, only one of the sides was able to obtain tanks, even though both sides tried to. If we talk about the political leanings of the sides, we can roughly divide them as follows. Supporters of the Soviet system, right-wingers and nationalists gathered around the Supreme Soviet, while technocrats and modernist liberals gathered around Yeltsin. An interesting alliance against the president, right-wing nationalists and communists. Both edges of the political spectrum were extremely unhappy with Yeltsin's actions. The Supreme Soviet resided in the White House in Moscow, also known as the House of Soviets and later the House of Government. It was around this building that the main actions of the conflict unfolded. On the day Rudskoy was appointed vice president, the first volunteer regiments to defend the White House began to form, under the leadership of the quite radical military leaders of the Supreme Soviet supporters. Yeltsin did not lag behind, and the police, Amon and other security forces began to blockade and cordon off the White House and surrounding areas. The White House was cut off from electricity and communications, and the building became a virtually besieged fortress. By October 2nd, the tension had reached its peak, with mass clashes between supporters and opponents of the president on Smolensk Square, near the Moscow City Hall and in front of the White House itself. 
the law enforcers were not always successful. Many units of relatively unarmed internal troops were defeated by ordinary protestant citizens. The point is that the Ministry of Defense, although formally supporting Yeltsin, was reluctant to send major units of the regular army to Moscow, so Yeltsin had only what was already stationed near the capital on his side. And he used it not so skillfully, so the confrontation was not as one-sided as it is sometimes described. There is evidence that during the storming of the White House, nearly half of the casualties among the military and the police were due to friendly fire and lack of coordination between different units. In addition, during the fighting from October 2nd to 4th, the protesters got their hands on many weapons and other military equipment, army trucks and even several armored vehicles. As a result of the local victories on October 3rd, Rutskoy ordered the storming of the Moscow mayor's building and the Astankino TV center to take control of the broadcasting of Yeltsin supporting channels. The mayor's office was seized quickly and without casualties under the leadership of Albert Makashov, and a red flag was raised over it. But the clashes near the TV center continued throughout the evening and night. During the assault, grenade launchers and heavy machine guns were used. As a result, 46 people – journalists, ambulance doctors and passers-by – were killed. Makashov then ordered a retreat to the White House. All supporters of the parliament pulled up to the building where the Supreme Soviet was meeting, gathering more than 10,000 people. But the people's deputies themselves were moving rather in the opposite direction. By October 4th, about 150 people out of almost 700 who were there by the end of September took part in the proceedings of the parliament. A state of emergency was declared in Moscow. On October 4th, on Yeltsin's order, the storming of the White House began, during which the building was shelled by tanks of the 12th Guards Tank Regiment of the Kantimirovsky Division. And we got this famous footage. White House defense leaders were arrested. At least 157 people were killed in the fighting, including about 30 military and police officers. About 400 people were wounded, most of them civilians. None of the rebel deputies were injured. There could have been even more casualties. The president took the harshest stance possible, planning to crush all defenders of the White House, including ordinary citizens. But he could not find enough support from the leaders of the defense ministry. Many elite security units were also hesitant, for example, the famous special forces groups Alpha and Wimpel, having received the order to storm the White House, refused to carry it out, and instead negotiated with its defenders, convincing about a thousand of them to lay down their arms. A full-scale civil war was averted, the Congress of People's Deputies was replaced by the State Duma, and the 1978 Constitution was replaced by the 1993 Constitution. Russia became a democratic federal state with a republican form of government in a couple of months. Did the good guys win? Of course, there were no forces of good and forces of evil there, because the same allegedly reactionary parliament that delayed democratic reforms, hated Russia and dreamed of the return of the USSR, elected Yeltsin as its chairman in 1991, passed a decree on Russia's sovereignty and opposed the GKCP, which sought to preserve the USSR. And there is not a single example of reforms that were useful for citizens which were previously slowed down by the parliament, that were accelerated after the parliament lost the opportunity to oppose the president in anything. That is, there are examples of accelerated reforms, but they are oddly specific. Mainly the transfer of more state property and revenues from natural resources into the hands of a small group of individuals close to the president. The famous privatization. At the same time, Yeltsin in general had a right to be dissatisfied with the parliament. When all your proposals for cooperation, sometimes quite reasonable, are rejected time after time, and by a body that should not exist in your new country at all, it really pisses you off. And he still had the support of the people, 
After all, he voluntarily held a nationwide referendum. And in April 1993, 58% of citizens said that they trusted the president. So Boris Nikolaevich believed that he had the right to deal with the rebels as he saw fit. Russia ended up with a state in which power was concentrated in the hands of whoever was stronger – the president. Especially if he is supported by the military. What kind of rule of law could we talk about after that? We can say that those events led to a mass disillusionment of ordinary citizens in politics, consolidating the alienation of common people from the authorities. If in 1991 there was an illusion that it was the people who took to the streets in August that helped to create a new and beautiful Russia, then here the same people could see that it makes no difference who and how many people took to the streets. The main thing is whose side the tanks are on. It is not surprising that the elections to the first Duma were won not by the pro-governmental Russia's Choice Party or the Communists, but by Vladimir Zhirinovsky's little-known LDPR which was voted for simply on the principle of I'll vote for anyone but not them and not them. Yes, the conflict itself ended in a tactical victory for Yeltsin and his associates, but it turned out to be a serious trauma for the Russian state and society. The events of the fall of 1993 dispelled any illusion nurtured since the late 1980s about the unity of the security forces and the army with the people. People saw that orders for the military remain more important than the fact that they shouldn't be using force against their own citizens. In many ways, it was then that the words democracy and liberal moved from the category of abstract ideals to the list of swear words in the minds of the majority. It is worth recalling that a proper assessment of the events of Black October has not yet been given, particularly because there has been no parliamentary investigation into what happened which, among other things, should have answered the questions about who and why brought the country to such a situation, and who is responsible for the deaths of people in those fall days. Who were the snipers who stayed in the attic of the house opposite the House of Soviets and fired at everyone during the storming? Who opened fire on the crowd of passers-by in Astankin? Who gave orders? The two sides naturally blamed each other, but the parliamentary investigation was blocked. The parliamentary majority agreed with the Kremlin that the arrested supporters of the Supreme Soviet would be set free, and in return the Duma would refuse to investigate. And some of the rebels who lost were quite successful in politics after that. For example, Nikolai Ryabov, one of the leaders of the Supreme Soviet and a fairly consistent opponent of the president. He worked quite happily as the head of the Central Election Commission from 1993 to 1996 including the elections in which Yeltsin was re-elected. So both sides involved in those events consisted of more or less the same people. And their main motive was not concern for the future of the country, not any high ideals, but the desire to take a little more power for themselves. At the same time, the current Russian authorities are also hesitant to give an unequivocal assessment of those events. The people who make up today's political elite were mostly members of the presidential camp. At the same time, the Kremlin's current rhetoric is closer to the side of the Supreme Soviet – patriotism, sovereignty and defense of national interests. But no one wants to be associated with the losing side. In 1993, Boris Yeltsin showed his toughness and strength, which also coincides with the country's current values. But in general, his reforms and rule are now characterized as a failure. This is similar to the way common people perceive those events. Almost two-thirds of those surveyed in 2017 either found it difficult to answer who was right 25 years ago, or believe that both sides were wrong. We will probably never really get answers to who was right and who was wrong. But the events of those days have forever laid the foundation for modern Russia as it looks now, 30 years later. Thanks for watching. The video on this topic was supposed to come out a year ago, but here it is. And as always, a huge shout out to my biggest supporters Take to One, Yildiz Zaharova, Kirill Klimuk, Zimon Berze, Jordan Lamont, Jimmy Albin, Ailey, Petr Idich, and Bruce Eternik. See you guys next time.